Some of you guys have been waiting to get in church for a minute, haven't you? It's nice to be in the house of the Lord. First Peter chapter 5, we'll ask the ushers to come forward. We'll pray for the offering and have ourselves a big time talking about finishing off fear. We will be in uh, 1 Samuel 17 as we get ready to talk about um, talking how David slew the giant in uh, you guys have giants in your lives of fear, certain types of fear. We're going to talk about how to do that biblically, how to handle them. Um, it's, it's a cool message, and uh, I'm blessed to uh, be able to deliver it. So uh, Peter talks about being a leader in a church, or, and it, you can use this in any, any aspect of leadership in your life. It says, so I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ, as well as partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. So oversight, so overseeing or having vision of where the people are, are headed to. They need to know where they're headed to. And you don't do it out of compulsion, but willingly as God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge but being examples to the flock. Say examples. So if you're leading a family, the family is to follow you because you follow Jesus, not the other way around. It's a, the goal is to, for the spirit to encourage the flesh, uh, not the flesh to encourage the spirit because all the flesh can do is actually kill off the spirit as we know. Um, and, and so if you're a mom or dad, you exemplify Christ-like behavior after you hear it, and they will follow the examples in their home. Don't ever tell your child to do something uh, in the name of Jesus if you're not doing it yourself. Just look at your neighbor and say hello on that one. Because a lot of times we as Christians or as parents want to do stuff, but we don't want our kids doing it. We watch things that we don't want our kids to watch, but we watch them anyways because we're adults. And if it's not good for the child, it surely isn't good for the adult. Who am I talking back to right now? If it ain't good for the child, it surely ain't good for you, Mama Bear. Mm -hmm. um, and then where I'm trying to take you to is number five. This is it. Listen to this, Gary. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe you, all of you with humility. And, and what humility is, is this is what God's attracted to is humility. And humility means to don't think so highly of yourself. <laughs> and if we don't think too highly of ourselves, that's when God exalts us. He actually finishes it by saying God opposes the proud uh, but he gives grace to the humble. So grace is favor, and I've told you before, if you don't want your favor, I'll take it. Just saying. It, it's kind of like, and, and I always tell God to supersize uh, my favor because I like everything supersized. I'm being honest. We're all drinking the true serum, and I had my cup before I came in. Um, I was at Skeeter's last night. Do you want to hear what I did at Skeeter's? Yeah. Skeeter's is an ice cream shop or frozen custard, quote, unquote. So when I went up to the window, it was my turn to go to the window. And senior, they have three different sizes of ice cream there. I don't know why they have three different sizes, but they do. Small, medium, and large. And I guess after she just kind of, when she seen me, she just goes, oh, you want the large, don't you? And I said, you're dang skippy, I do. <laughs> so I like God to supersize his favor in my life as we're humble. So let's pray since the Sheehan's brought the offering forward. Lord, we ask you to give uh, the Sheehan's a supersize uh, favor. Bless them today as they bring forth the offering. Uh, let it be used for your kingdom. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. So applaud the Lord, and we're so happy to be in his house. So finish off fear is the title of the message, and we've been dealing with it. So this is the last message I'm going to kind of preach on fear. Then next week, it's a setup for a 4th of July message where we talk about freedom and, and freedom in Christ, waving the flag and all that kind of stuff, which is totally my favorite subject. Uh, and I love being uh, in America, and I love all that it represents. Amen.
Um, okay, so finishing off fear. Um, it says, now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. And they were gathered at Sokah, uh, which belonged to Judah. Let me set the stage for you. And we're going to, since the story is actually about 54 verses um, and I, I, there's no way I can possibly like preach through 54 verses. So I kind of give you the, the high spots in this. So we got a guy named uh, Goliath, uh, loudmouth. He's, he's defying the, the ranks of Israel, and he's on and on and on. He's kind of like a, a dog that never shuts up. He's just over there always, da, 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 you know. And do you ever, does anybody ever, do any of you guys own dogs? I mean, like somebody's ringing the doorbell, and good, there's only two people. Uh, Three. Oh, now you guys all coming out like I guess I'm about to do it. They're just barking away, and sometimes like I got we have a, one of our dogs is blind, uh, and his name is Zeke, uh, short for Ezekiel, and uh, he just like barks at like anything because he's just not sure what to bark at. So if he hears anything, he thinks he ought to just bark. And it's cute for people that pull up and go, oh, oh he's blind. He go, oh, well, he just barks at everything. Um, Goliath is kind of that way. He's just barking. He just, uh, he's wanting somebody to fight him, wanting somebody to fight him, and, and that's kind of what the story is. And then King David, or little David, is, is like 17 at this time, and he goes up and fights him. And so that's kind of where we're headed with this story. Uh, and there's a story inside the story, and then there's a backstory to it. Uh, and I'll try to plug in all the high points here. But the goal is to get you to give up that thing that you're fearful of, or struggling with, um, and we believe that everybody struggles with some form of fear at, at some level. And um, I've told you before, a lot of times, and when we finally get set free from fear, we dream up things to be fearful of, to feel normal, so we feel like we used to feel because it's abnormal to feel well. Did I say that right? I mean, it was kind of confusing, but. Um, and I think society has kind of groomed us into that, whether it's, the, whether it's disease or it's people or it's all these kind of things that are going on. We think that, and we have all our TVs on and all our gadgetry on, and, and I think that we're, we're feeding the flesh so much when we could be spending more time feeding the spirit man. I think we need to live in balance and not be naive about the things that are going on in the world but we live in the world, but as Christians, we're not of the world. And, we, and we're the spirit man lives inside of me, so i got to continue to feed him and not feed the machine so much in this fear-mongering and things that are going on today. That's kind of what the story's going to do is help you with that. And it, it, it's been, quite frankly, it's been great. Um, go to verse 3. It says, And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with the valley between them. So what does that look like, Gary? What is that? So they're on one side, and, and, and God's army is on the other side. And it's, you know, I don't know, 17 miles from Jerusalem. And, so, and uh, that's kind of the landscape. And it reminds me of when, you, when we were kids, you know, and, and, and somebody was going to fight. Do you remember when everybody was going to fight? It was like the two tough guys were going to fight, and they, and they were going to meet. And, you, and if you didn't do it right there in the hallway, you did it on the football field. And it was talked about, man. It was a big, it was a big thing. And if you, if you couldn't get it off there, then you always met at the park. I grew up down here in Maryland Heights, and that's where you met. If you wanted to fight somebody, you met them down at the park. 4.30 at the park. Amen. And, it's, and, and I always thought about that, and I thought, man, this is so cool to be able to fight down here. And uh, it's kind of what's going on there. They're staging up for the big battle. But we know a lot of times in life, there's, there's more barking than there is action. Let me say that again, Ken, so you understand it. There's, there's like actually more barking then there is action. It's, there's always mean dogs, but you, you never really know how mean they are until you, like, stick your hand over the fence. You're like, how mean is he? And you're like, I don't know. Try to stick your hand over there. 
And they always ask this stupid question when the hair's up on his back and his, 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 his tail's cocked over. Can I pet him? I'm like, oh, I don't think I would. <laughs> Some dogs are like that. You just can't pet them. Well, here's the case here, and, and we'll... And we'll We'll throw out some uh, description as of this guy in verse 4. And it says, There came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath. Say Goliath. Goliath. So Goliath is, watch this, hit man. Goliath is built up. He's built up this heavy reputation. And, and, and Big Steve is tall, but he's nowhere near as tall as Goliath was. And you say, well, how big is this cat? Ask me that question. He's so big it takes two people just to look at him. Nine, f- nine foot nine is what his dimensions are. <laughs> six cubits in a span. So six cubits. A cubit is 18 inches from your finger to your elbow. And a span hit man's nine inches. So that would make him nine foot nine. That's a big dude. But you guys are guys. And those actually are the kind of guys you like, you know what? I think I could take him. I, th- I just, yeah, I think I can. You know, guys think that way. And girls, elbow your husbands right now because he's going, he's right, I do. I really think I can. <laughs> That's the way. That's the way God created guys. He's never going to go into the battle thinking he can get whipped. Uh, I got this guy. Let me, let me, let me fight him. Uh, so this is, this is, this is some real time stuff. So the Goliath in your life has got a big reputation, huge. Don't go out there. Don't get out there. Be afraid. Don't go here. Don't go there. Don't do this. Don't touch that. Wash your hands here. Wear this, wear that. It's fear-mongering as you get closer to celebrating your freedom on 4th of July. You'll watch the enemy crank up the fear machine because he's a... Who am I talking to? Because as soon as he fi- you find out that you can actually be free, he's going to crank up the fear to try to bring you back down where he thinks you need to be. You need to tell that Goliath, I plan on being free, I plan on celebrating my freedom, and I plan on getting happy on that day. Amen. Amen. Uh, and, 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 you know, I told you, we are, uh, say phobia so I can start talking about that. Phobia, we're scared of a lot of things here. Make sure your shoes are on. Have you washed your hands? And then I told you about you guys that get on WebMD, man. You're the best doctor in the world. Oh, 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 it is. It, it, it's the kidneys this time. No, it's not. You just lifted something too heavy. It's your back. <laughs> and you think about that as you get older. People would follow you around. They're going to go, hey, you know what? You got supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Did you know that? No. no, I just got a bad shoulder and a knee, a bum knee. It's called gravity. It's called life. Everything doesn't have to be diagnosed on the internet. Or the interstate, whatever it is. But this guy's got this big reputation and nobody wants to fight him. I'm saying today that you put down or cut the head off of this giant in your life. You say, well, why don't I add for, aim for the tail? Because he might come back and bite you again. And a lot of times when you're looking at that, you know, you you go into my one little barn over there, Nature Boy, over in a south pasture over there. There's, there's some copperheads in there. When you see one, I demand you cut his head off. Because I might go in and grab for a bale and he might bite me. And he said, you should have cut my head off instead of my tail. Because I'm cute, but I'm deadly. I'm cute, but I'm deadly. And that's what we need in our life is, to, is, is finally put down the fear that is keeping you guys from walking into glory with the Lord. And each person's got their own, their own thing. And, and I don't know what it is, you know, when one eyeball's getting too big or it's or, You ever notice like something ain't completely symmetrical? You're like, and it's a revelation after like 55 years you look down and you go, oh my gosh, my one foot's bigger than the other. I 
I, this is like therapy for me, so excuse me. But I'll get back to preaching. I mean, do you ever notice that? You go, my finger's crooked. <laughs> Anybody who works with their hands is going to have crooked fingers. But they'll try to diagnose it and say, well, I heard it was a, the such and such disease, the crooked finger disease. <laughs> Amen. We want, we want to hype it up. We want to, we want to build Goliath up. And if you, if you were raised when I was raised, your dad would just tell you to what? Rub some dirt on it. <laughs> just rub some dirt on it. Or if, if you were a ninny, you would have go over and have your mom kiss it. <laughs> just joking. Oh, I'm never coming back there again. So listen to how they, they built this guy up. He's got a coat of mail, which means it's, it's, his, it's his outfit. It's 125 pounds. Who's ever going to fight a guy that's got all the armor and he's 9 foot 9, Tommy, and he's got 125 pounds of, of, of armor on and he's got a, a, a spear the size of a weaver's beam and the head on it's 15 pounds. Who wants to fight that cat? Well, apparently nobody until King David comes along. Four foot nine, about 17 years old. He said, what made him different besides everybody else? The Spirit of God. No, you didn't hear me. You would have said something. The Spirit of God. It's, there's something different about him. And, and I'll tell you about the way he woke up one morning. And we'll, we'll, we'll pull all this stuff together. So all my online friends, listen to this. So in verse 8, it says, he stood at the ranks, uh, shouting at the ranks of Israel. And this is kind of like the... The guy just constantly goes on and on and on, and, and this, is your, this is your battle here, guys, that, that, are, that are fearful of these different things. It keeps going on and on and on and on. It's kind of like the, the bully that's getting your lunch money all the time. You're afraid to walk up to the corner, and, you know, he's going to ask, give me that, give me your lunch money. Back when I was in school, it was like 35 cents, and you get two cents for an extra milk. Give me your money, and he'll keep asking for it, Tina, over and over again until one day your dad finds out that you were giving your lunch money away. And what did my dad say? He said, punch him right in the nose when he asks for the lunch money next time. And you know what? He quit asking for it, or he got it. And that's what I tell my youngest grandson. I said, it's three days in the hospital, sudden death. And he would say, he's, go ahead, applaud that. Uh -huh. Or say, that's cute. That's, yeah, that's what my grandpa, he said, say it, grandpa, you know. All right, I'll see you next week. I ain't got anything else. So you, when you're a grandpa, you got to do that. You're Superman. Amen? Bigger than life, my grandpa can take him. I have such a good time with those kids, man. <laughs> Amen, and I'll move on. So, the, so I, show, I told you the, his, his, how tall he was. I showed you about his coat of mail. I showed you about his weaver's beam, how, how big and thick it was, and he had 15 pounds uh, on the head. And he stands out there in verse 10. He says, and the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Here's the deal. You can defy a lot of things, but never defy the ranks of Israel, or you will be in some deep water. You thought I was going to say doo-doo, didn't you? And, and, and anybody that makes fun of the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is going to pay dearly. So if you've made fun of him, you can get that corrected today as long as you've got breath in your lungs because later on the other side of eternity, it's too late. So look at your neighbor and say, do it now, Jack. Mm-hmm. Uh, so at the end of verse 11, it says they were greatly uh, dismayed, or they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of the Ephorite of Bethlehem and Judah uh, named Jesse, who had eight sons in the days of Saul. Uh, the three oldest sons of Jesse followed Saul to battle, and the names of his three sons were Elab, the firstborn next to Abinadab, uh, and the third, Shemamai. David was the youngest of the three eldest that followed Saul, but David went back and forth 
from Saul to feed his father's sheep in Bethlehem. So he's small. They believe he's insignificant. Uh, he worked for Saul. In this time here, I want to let you know, this is like a two-year span where he was working for Saul, working for his daddy, uh, feeding the sheep and all these kind of things. And uh, my, my son David, you know, I got all these sons. And then my son David is up on the hill. So we know that David, or King David, got anointed back in chapter 15 and 16. And he's going to have to clean up the things King Saul didn't do. God ordered King Saul to take these one group outside the city and slaughter them and all that, and he didn't do that. He cut the tail off, but he didn't cut the head off. So all these things in your life will come back unless you cut the head off so they never arise again. Today's the day you lay that spiritual marker down and say, you know what, I'm not going to be afraid of elevators and escalators and, and moles on my cheek and all that. And what's the deal? Why is moles all of a sudden bad? I mean, they'll, they'll look at my arm and they'll go, hey, you've been out in the sun quite a bit, haven't you? And I go, yeah, and they go, you need to have that mole checked. Check for what? What they're trying to do is heap some fear on you, even if you're healthy. You got to be careful about how much you receive from other people. They mean well, but they can plant seeds of doubt in your mind. So he goes back and forth. You'll get it here in a minute. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand in the morning and evening. And I don't know about you, but here he is, Demi, walking back and forth, back and forth. I'm going to whip you. I'm going to whip you. He did this for 40 days. I'm like, shut up and whip somebody if you're going to, boy. You're all talk. You're a blowhard. And Jesse said to, his, uh, to David, his son, so here his dad is using him as a delivery boy because he wasn't sure what else to, to use him for. So he says, I want you to take this food up to the fighting men. So he takes the food up to the fighting men, and then here's where life starts to change for you and King David. I want you to think about all the things that are going on in society. In verse 20, put that up there with me, please. And David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper. I believe that's the day that David became not only king in his heart, but king in his mind. He got out of bed that day and said, you know what? I've been fighting and my people have been fighting in fear of this big Goliath. Today's the day we're going to go to war, and this is the day I'm going to whip that thing. When you get out of bed in the morning, you need to make up your mind what it is you want to do and let no man, no devil deter you from you laying down your giant in your life and picking up the banner of love through Jesus Christ. Amen. you got to make up your mind. You can't wait and have somebody else do it for you. Day after day after day, you know, I'm going to deal with it one day, I'm going to deal with it one day. You need to put your feet on the floor, and the devil needs to shake. It needs to be the other way around and go, oh, my gosh, he's going to stand and fight me on this day. And God's people said amen. amen. And that can be an addiction. That can be whatever it is. So David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper, and took the provisions and went to Jesse as he commanded him. And... Uh, they're at the battle line shouting the war cry in Israel and the Philistines drew up battle and the army against army and David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. I think sometimes if we're going to move forward, we have to leave things in the past for somebody else to take care of so you don't go back to them. And if you, if you remember the, uh, the story of Elisha, he had, to, he had to kill his cows and he had to burn the plow. I preached a message on it. Kill the cow, burn the plow. Because he, be, he didn't want to be tempted to go back to his old life of farming. He wanted to make sure that he followed the Lord and he didn't want any distractions. I think sometimes in our life we want to get rid of some things in our life, but we physically won't do them. Amen. And I'm talking about purging if you don't know what I'm talking about. A lot of times when we, God tells us to go through it, and it's funny about purging, and say, tell me a story. Well, I will if you're dragging it out of me. So me and my wife are trying to grow in, uh, grow in Christ, Kenny, and we're going through our house, you know, and, and you, you never really know how, what kind of life you used to live until you go through your house and start to purge it. And you go through your house, and you go, you know, we're going to purge our house. We're getting rid, of, getting rid of all the bad stuff. 
and getting rid of all the stuff that we used to do and getting rid of all the different plaques and all the different things. And then you, you get into it and you're like, shouldn't we like keep this one? <laughs> hold, on, should, hold on for a second. Should we like keep this one because grandma gave me this one? Yeah, I don't care who gave it to you. If it ain't pleasing to the Lord, it don't need to be in your house. And we can rationalize it all day long, and we got all kinds of people who can tell you why we should keep it. But if you keep it, it's going to end up calling you back into the old lifestyle that you were trying to get away from, and somebody ought to say amen on that. Oh, we're squirming in our chairs now. Because the flesh gets hungry and you feed it a little, it just requires more and more and more. What I'm trying to get you to do today is feed the spirit man that lives inside of you. Verse 24, all the men of Israel, uh, when they saw the man fled from him, they were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, you have seen this man come up. Surely he has come to defy Israel and the king will enrich the man who will kill him with great riches. So here's the incentive package. He wants you to be a hit man. He's going to give you your daughter, his daughter, and you don't have to pay taxes ever. Oh boy, praise the Lord for that. No taxes. Amen. In verse 26, he says, And David said to the man who stood by, he said, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach? He says, For who is this? And I got this underlined in my Bible. Maybe you want to do this. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the army of the living God? He goes, How dare you defy the Lord? How, how dare you defy the Lord? How dare you use the Lord's name in vain? It, it offended him. He goes, I can't believe all you men are standing around and been listening to this blow hard for 40 days. Somebody needs to shut him up. I guess I'll do it. Straight out of Sunday school, he's ready to whip somebody. Amen. I'll ask you guys to rise up for this part here. Listen to this. Go ahead. So I, I, I and I'll narrate some of this stuff because it, it's, it starts to get pretty doggone cool here. So in verse 33, it says, and Saul said to David, so right, right when you get ready to get rid of your fears, Right when you get ready to get rid of your fear, somebody's going to walk up to you and they're going to go, hey, you know what? We don't think you ought to do that. You ought to just stay right where you're at in your comfort level. Don't do that. Just, yeah, it, it is scary out there. I want to know how long somebody can be scared. I would rather explode in a million pieces in front of everybody than to submit to a spirit of fear. You've been in the doctors and the hospitals and had the diagnosis. You go, you know what? Just do it. Let's get it over with. Oh, they, it's, it's, it's called fear-mongering. It's out there everywhere, and, it's a, and it happens to everybody. Everybody's trying to get free, and it don't matter what it is. You can, all kinds of examples. Well, you know, Pastor, you're going to get back on that motorcycle. Uh, Pastor, you're going to get back on that horse. Yeah, I am. You're too old to do that. You got bucked off. You, you know, hey, yeah, I'm gonna sit. What are you sit in a corner, suck my thumb like some little baby, and be an example for my family? Uh, well, he quit riding because he, he got. Yeah, he's in a hospital. So what? When I go out, I want to go with my boots on. I don't want to be sitting in a corner like some little Christian sissy. I ain't big on that at all. I'll be honest with you. And it's not very becoming to God's men of the church either. And can I get an amen there? I'll bark. We're going to whip demons and devils and everything. We're going to cast out devils and everything. Well, well, we can't go to the hospital, though. That stuff might get us. Might leap on you. Did you know that, Pastor? It could, it could leap on you. Get you. And get you in the parking lot, too, if you don't watch it. But they want me to be brave if I'm going to pray for their child. No, oh, you didn't hear me. What I'm trying to do is tell you there's a, there's a Goliath in everybody's family. There are all kinds. Here's what I'm telling you. We take calculated risk as Christians. 
I'm not telling you to be silly and act like things don't exist. Be safe and all that. I'm not telling you to do that. But I don't want anybody to talk you out of what's rightfully yours. Some of you guys are trying to get free and have fun. You go, well, I guess we better not do that. I just want to say something. and I, I'm glad I belong to a church where they believe in the power of Jesus Christ. I just, I just like being there. Amen. And, and what I believe you celebrate, you'll get more of. I was thinking that the other day when I had some friends out with me and we was out at a steakhouse eating a steak. The gospel reminds me of a big, fat, juicy steak. Every piece of it is just so wonderful, isn't it? The enemy tries to keep you away from the steakhouse and he tries to keep you away from God's house. Amen? Yeah, I, 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 like, I, like, I, I like being around Christians. I like being around people. And I like witnessing to people about the, the freedom in Christ. I, I, lo I love everything about freedom. It is such a great, wonderful privilege to live in America. I'm reminded that every time I see the flag and I read the Bible, I go, man, I got so much freedom. It's un unbelievable. So here's how the story plays out. Watch this. He said, so his, Saul said, don't go up there. He said, you're just a boy. You, you don't need to fight that fight. Let somebody else fight that fight. And what David's saying is he said, nobody else will fight it. I, I just got out of youth camp. And I'm walking past all the big boys to whip this big giant because all you guys are doing is sitting around talking smack. That's what this is. Got a bunch of people jawing about they're going to whip a devil. If you're going to whip a devil, it starts today. And we lay the fear down at the altar and you move on from it. And you get out there and you start winning those victories for the Lord. <laughs> Tell the devil, I'm done with the talk. I'm done with the talk. I'm done with it. It's time for the church of Christ to grow up and go, I'm done with the baby games. And I look at it, quite frankly, as, as, as children dragging that old nasty blankie around anyways. That's a mess. And carrying around a baba, you know, sometimes you're like, you know what, you need to put the baba away, Junior. You're seven now. <laughs> Can I say? That was funny. I didn't say that in the last one. That was good. But that's what God looks at when he looks at you dragging your blankie around. You're seven or you're 17 or whatever. He's going, man, you need to grow up, dude. Amen. Can you say grow up just a little bit? I don't think. Grow up. You know, I think it's time we give the, the giants in our lives a knuckle sandwich. That was, that's what I, my dad would tell you. Give them a knuckle sandwich. Verse 45, then David said to the Philistine, you come at me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God and the armies of Israel who you defile. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I will strike you down and I'll cut off your head. <laughs> Woo! My, my, that, that's powerful preaching right there. Be fixing to cut somebody's head off there. Let's drop the house lights down and we'll pray on that note. So I'll tell you the rest of the story. And, uh, and then I, I'm going to do the same thing I did in all the services. Just ask you to come up if you want to and lay your fear at the, uh, at, the, at, the, at the altar. You go, well, Pastor, why, why should I do that? Why, why is it important that I have that spiritual marker in my life? I think it's important that Christians have a lot of spiritual markers in their life. You know, the day you get saved, the day you get baptized, the day you laid fear down, the, the day I, left, I got rid of my addiction and all that. So all that stuff needs to be laid there. Go, I did it on this day. You mark that down. That's your victory. You need to quit trying to live everybody else's life. We're, we, wanna, we want like a pigeonhole everybody. This group needs to go here. This group needs to go here. I don't need somebody telling me what I need to do. I don't like that. Amen? I'm a, I'm, I'm a free person in Christ. And I'm not going to run around being f fearful of everything. I want to be wise about things, but I want to be fearful of them. 
So let me ask you this. So as uh, you find out that he kills Goliath and we know he hits him with the slingshot or the sling, he falls down, he was dead at that point. He cut his head off to make a statement. He puts it on a pole and he takes it back to Jerusalem. He puts it in the trophy case, nature boy. How about that for a trophy? That big old fat head laying up in there. That was the day I killed the giant. Remember him talking, all that stuff, but we knocked him down. We got his old nasty head in the trophy case. Nasty teeth and everything. So I'm going to ask you this question here as you close your eyes, and I'm just going to ask you, I want you to activate the spirit man that lives inside of you and just say, yes, Pastor, I do have this fear, whatever it is. And I'm, when you get up here, I'm not going to tell you to name it or anything like that. You just say, I do have this fear. You come forward. I'm going to pray for you. And when you walk away, you can look at it. You laid it at the feet of, of God, and then you left on from it. So when you leave it there at the feet of God, don't come back and ask for it next week so you can start worrying about it again. You go, I gave that to God. He needs to deal with it. I can't. There's nothing else I can do. What do you think of that? Hey, well, we're, you're trying to fight God's battles. Oh, you trying to fight. I'm going to be God for the day. I'm going to fight all these battles myself. Well, I told you before, if you're trying to fight all these battles in the natural, you got a right to be afraid. But if, you're, if, if Jesus lives inside of you, th that battle's already been won. So here we go on the count of three if you got that fear. I want you just to raise your hand and acknowledge it. One, two, three. Hands up. I got this. Got Okay. Here's the hands for all you guys that got that fear. I want you to come down here, right here at the altar. Just come on. You already acknowledge it. Now let's just take a walk with it. Come on. Drop it off here at the altar. So some of them are, you know, the fears of the, the different sicknesses and the, and the things and the phobias going on in the world. And, you know, I told you it's airplanes, it's escalators, it's elevators. You don't need to make fun of somebody because they have a fear of something you think is trivial. Everybody's got some kind of crazy fear. You're like, and, and then when you leave from here, Gary, after you drop it off, you're going to look back at this in 10 years and go, I was afraid of that? You've got to be kidding me. What a gas that was. Wouldn't you like to look at you, that big giant thing and look at it as you walk away from the altar and you, and you look back at this? And you say, Pastor Pat, can we roll back the tape? Because I remember when I laid that down. All right. Let's pray about that together. And I thank you for you guys getting free from that. So, Father God, all the people that are here and the here and on live stream and they're laying down this fear or this phobia or maybe it's laying down something else in their life. It's a, I don't know, it's kind of a nasty little deal or whatever it is or an addiction or a thing and they, they move on from it. They're not plagued by it. They're not submitting to it. And I pray, Lord God, that they pick up this banner of love and a banner of courage. Man, it's so awesome, guys, to have the, the spirit of courage on you. And when we leave from here today, we are not going to let it have any power over us anymore. And that will all be by the, by the doing of, of the Lord. And we recognize that we've been set free from that today, this day forward. And in thy name of Jesus and his people said amen with applause. Hallelujah.